Nobody in the first three rows, just so like I like it. <laughs> Do I spit when I talk? Is it on? This is on. The light's on. Is it coming across? Check, 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 check. All good, Joel? All right. Good morning. Welcome to Forge Road Bible Chapel, and thanks for choosing to be here today. Today is my, uh, today is May 9th, so it's a very special day because my it's my sister's birthday. <laughs> Say Mother's Day. Sophie, go get some flowers for your mother. <laughs> Kidding. Obviously, it's Mother's Day, although it's also my sister's birthday. Happy birthday, Beth. You know, I feel like every time Bill talks about Beth, he just gushes about how much he loves his wife and how easy it is to be married to Beth. And well, I lived with her first. <laughs> and I have to say, she hasn't changed at all. Not only was Beth really easy to live with as a sister, but she was a great example of what it looked like to love Jesus, and she was a good measuring stick when I was eva evaluating potential life partners. Not that every girl who measured up would have me. <laughs> Cass may have settled. But Mother's Day is one of those universal holidays to be remembered, not because we are all mothers, but because we all have mothers. So quickly, I'd like to say happy birthday to my mother. This is us, 40 years ago nearly, and also to my wife, Cass, who's the mother of our children. This is us with Sophie nearly 18 years ago. But there's a third group that I'd like to acknowledge this Mother's Day, and that group will be represented by this picture. This is my oldest daughter, Sophie, but that is not her child. <laughs> That's Bradley Sauerwald, maybe a year or so ago, and although Bradley has a mother of his own, on Sunday nights at youth group, he has 10 mothers. Both Sourwald boys, Declan and Bradley, usually benefit, I believe, from the added attentions of all the kids at youth group, not just the girls. Because even though they come to youth group because their parents help lead it, there's also a side ministry going on. They're included in our activities, and aware of it or not, they're helping build relationships in the group. And this is happening all the time in life and in church. And often the interactions with kids are not just happenstance, they're intentional. I know that. I know many of you are dedicated to being a part of children's ministry in Sunday school here at the chapel. Many of you are committed to life ministry where the acts of hospitality and the shepherding that you do includes whole families where children benefit from seeing faith in action and individuals benefit from loving God collectively. Mark 3, 32, 35 says, a crowd was sitting around Jesus and said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. So thank you to everyone, biological mother or not, who chooses to be spiritual family to others here and do the good work, which is living the gospel and doing the will of God. Starting last week, we are in a four-week study named The Two Ways. And we've been looking at passages in Matthew. There are several comparisons made that give some different angles on the same theme. So Jesus while addressing what it means to follow him, uses metaphors to relay deep truths. Last week, Zach and Kyle <laughs> it's because he's so far away. I couldn't... Last week, Zach and Kyle talked about two houses, similar in appearance, but having different foundations. This week, we'll look at two gates and two paths. 
Four weeks ago, I closed out our first Corinthian study. Uh, I had chapter 16, the final chapter in that book. And whenever I, whenever I speak and I have a passage, I like to kind of see what's out there, you know? I like to, I like to use, uh, a lot of people use the Bible project. I like to see a rough overview of the book. And so I was looking at the first Corinthians video and they go through the whole book. And then when they get to chapter 16, they're like, and eh, that's like Paul's final salutation to the end. Like that's all they had chapter six. This passage is totally different. Not a whole chapter, it's only two verses. However, there's a lot. There's a lot written on all of these parts of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, as you look through chapters five through seven, there's lots of coverage. Lots of coverage of it. Hopefully, you guys, I gleaned a lot from First Corinthians 16. Hopefully you did as well. But as we look through this passage, there we're kind of at the end of, towards the end of this, chapters 5 through the end of chapter 7. There's five discourses kind of throughout that. But today, verses 13 and 14, it's the end of this section that's encapsulating the central idea that one packed by referencing some of the other parts of the Sermon on the Mount. There's much that we could glean from these two verses in particular, but I want to focus in on one main point. I want to challenge myself and you through what it presents to us. So let's start by reading it. Matthew 7, 13 through 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard, that leads to life, and those who find it are few. There are two gates, there are two groups, there are two paths, and there are two outcomes. There's two levels of difficulty, but there's only one source of life. Jesus here is talking to his disciples and his followers, and he's talking to people who have a knowledge of God, and are operating under some level of understanding of what he wants, whether that is by nature the fact that they follow Jewish custom, or they have left everything and they are physically following him. To give a quick snapshot of time and place, Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. And for thousands of years, followers of the true God have awaited the coming of the Savior and the establishment of God's kingdom. So much of the resistance that Jesus experiences is not from people who deny God during his earthly ministry, but they deny what God's kingdom is and Jesus' part in it. And so while we live in a different time and we are not Jewish, the issues are similar. As Zach showed us last week, Jesus teaching these chapters is an assault on legalism and includes a call to true faith and salvation. The legalistic Pharisees are often the easy bad guy because they're so vocal about their opposition to Jesus. But there were many groups within Judaism, people who were followers of God, who had their own ideas of what his kingdom was about. And all of them were wrong. In a nutshell, our passage today is the appeal to which Jesus has been moving through the whole sermon. Chapter 5, 6, building up to this. He gives the call here to decide now about becoming a citizen of God's kingdom and inheriting eternal life or remaining a citizen of this fallen world and receiving damnation. The way to life is on God's terms alone. The way to damnation is on any term a person wants because every way but God's leads to the same fate. Jesus presents the choice of entering the kingdom or not entering the kingdom. Here he focuses on the inevitable decision that every person must make, the cross where, crossroads where he must decide on the gate he will enter and the way that he will go. So why not just a gate? Why is there a gate and a path? Jesus, is, Jesus Christ is the gate, just so that's up front. You want true life, you want to really know the Father, you must know the Son. John 10, 9. 
I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved. John 14, 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Acts 4, 12. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. In 1 Timothy 2, 5. There is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Let me be very clear. The gates and the paths are connected. You can't enter the narrow gate and then walk the broad path or vice versa. However, I believe the imagery here is used because salvation is a forgiveness of sin, but also a turning over of one's life. Repentance, obedience, true love for God. So this pass, these passages, they deal with the world, but it isn't the main focus. The possibility of salvation coming through any other means is lumped in with any religion or belief in God, which does not include Jesus Christ. And that, that shouldn't be shocking. The Bible's very clear. However, it's not a popular stance. As we've been discussing this series for the last however many months, uh, talk about the two ways, a song kept coming to mind. The song was released in 1989 by the Indigo Girls, and it includes the lyrics. When I start saying it, you're going to know it. I went to the doctor, I went to the mountains. I looked to the children. I drank from the fountains. There's more than one answer to these questions pointing me in a crooked line. And through the course of the song, the subject is seeking meaning, seeking truth. And I looked up the lyrics. Oh, I couldn't find it at first because I had the title of the song wrong in my head. The song is closer to fine. I thought it was closer to find, like, they're trying to find something. But the main course says, the less I seek my source for some definitive, the closer I am to being fine, the closer I am to find. And then, yeah, you know, that. <laughs> but I think it's equally ironic that according to the lyrics, the less they sought for definitive answers, the closer they were to not finding answers, but they were the closer they were to being fine, not having answers. And that's the world. This is the perception that's based on lies. There is more, there is more than one answer to these questions, but all but one answer is wrong. And it doesn't mean you'll be fine if you find one of those answers. The general opinion of lazy thinkers is that all roads lead to the same destination, right? We use the image of a mountaintop, all paths leading up the mountain. You get to the top no matter which path you take. But I don't know about you, but when I drive, I use a GPS because if I take any turn off of any road, it doesn't get me to where I want to go. All destinations are not the same. We need to know exactly how to get there. The Bible is clear, as is this passage, that if you aren't entering by the narrow gate of Jesus Christ, you won't find salvation. You cannot know God. If the big question is how to find true life, then Jesus is the answer. I find the Indigo Girls song catchy. But the sentiment that if we just stop worrying about truth, we will be better off is patently wrong. I looked up an interview with whichever indigo girl wrote it, and she said this, an interview, that song is about not beating yourself up too hard to get your answer from one place. There's no universal remedy. That in order to be balanced or feel closer to fine, it's okay to draw from this or to draw from that, to draw from a bunch of different sources. So. It's about being confused, but looking for the answers, and in the end, knowing that you're going to be fine. No seeking, just one definitive answer. 
Jesus was not addressing an indie rock band from the 80s in the Sermon on the Mount. However, he was addressing what it truly was to be in a right and eternal relationship with God. The choice is between the one and the many. The one right and the many wrongs. The one true way and the many false ways. There are not many roads to heaven, but one. Man cannot come to God in any of the ways that man himself devises, but only in the one way that God himself has provided. The contrast that Jesus makes is not between good people and bad people, or religious people and non-religious. It's a, it's a contrast between trusting God and trusting self, between God's grace and man's works. Even as Jews worshiped the true God and sought his kingdom, there were diverse views on what it is that he wanted. Factions arose. Uh, Pharisees and Sadducees, they're the, the well-known ones. Pharisees believed right religion consisted of following the divine laws and religious tradition. The law, they adhered to the laws of the past. The Sadducees, they were focused on the present. They modified scripture and tradition to fit with their own philosophies, and they didn't believe in supernatural. Lesser known, the Essenes renounced material comforts, and they believed that right religion was separating yourself completely from the world. And the zealots thought that right religion centered on radical, political activism, and they wanted to physically overthrow Rome. So whether they were traditionalists or modernists or activists or separatists, they all had an outward focus on their spirituality. The same primary types of religious factions exist today. And the focus of the Sermon on the Mount was to address all these ideas that had gotten God followers away from God. Even in trying to strictly obey God's laws, the Pharisees had made their appearances so important that they couldn't see past themselves when God himself stood before them in the form of Jesus Christ. We talk about this all the time with youth group stuff. Like They're literally arguing with God about how to best follow God. True religion in God's kingdom wasn't rituals, philosophies, locations, or military might. It was right attitude towards God and other people. The dominant message is that one must not find comfort merely in right theology, much, much less contemporary philosophy, geographical separation, or military and political activism. Right theology is essential, as is being contemporary in the right way, separating ourselves from worldliness, and taking stands on moral issues, all that's important. But those external things must flow from our right internal life and attitudes if they are to serve and please God. And this brings us to the main point of today's verses. The wide gate isn't just Islam or Hinduism and secularism. It's anything that replaces Jesus Christ. Even obeying God's laws, being biblically moral, and treating everyone in a loving way, all those things are part of the wide gate and the wide path. Zach talked last week about how these passages can be a little scary. They cause us to examine ourselves. And I know parts of the larger church can be very legalistic. But parts can also be very modernist. And I know for everyone who has believed the lie that their good actions are what make them right before God, there is someone else who believes their actions don't matter at all. Both are wrong. Because both focus only externally. This is what I do, or this is what's been done, therefore nothing else matters. External actions matter, but as a, a result of internal life. Salvation secures sinners, but they are secured to new life, not an old one. 
to claim to follow the Spirit without, without obeying the letter is to be a liar. And to follow the letter without following the Spirit is to be a hypocrite. To follow the Spirit in the right attitude and the letter in the right action is to be a faithful child of God and his loyal subject. So the gate is clear. Christ alone. But the path is difficult. What do, we, what do we do with Jesus Christ? For me, this is the scarier thing talked about in these verses because I know where salvation comes from. I know what the narrow gate is. But have I really gone through it? Do I walk the narrow path? What do I seek? Do I like to stroll the easy walking path or do I struggle in my climb on the narrow way? The way that is broad is attractive. It's inclusive. It's indulgent. It is permissive. And it's self-oriented. All things that we are on our own, that we are attracted to, that we're drawn to. The broad way says that all you need to do is profess Jesus. Or at least be religious. And you're readily accepted in that large and diverse group. On the broad way, sin is tolerated. Truth is moderated. Humility is ignored. God's word is praised, but not studied. His standards are admired, but not followed. The way requires, the wide way requires no spiritual maturity, no moral character, no commitment, and no sacrifice. To quote Proverbs 14, 12, it is the way which seems right to a man, but whose end is the way of death. The way that is narrow, however, is difficult. It is the demanding way, the way of self-denial and the cross. If we don't just want to know how salvation works and instead want to embrace relationship with God and truly dwell in his kingdom, we look to what Jesus said about what being in the kingdom looks like. Go back to Matthew chapter 5. Jesus starts the Sermon on the Mount with nine statements called the Beatitudes in uh, 5, 1 through 12. Each starts with the words, blessed are. The word blessed in that context means happy, fortunate, at peace. And if many of the people who call themselves Christians are unhappy, they see life in Christ as inconvenient, and are restless in their spiritual life, it may be because they aren't experiencing things that Jesus names in these verses. Blessed are the poor of spirit. Not a dejected person or a depressed one, but someone who recognizes their utter spiritual bankruptcy apart from God. Someone who knows he is lost and hopeless. Blessed are those who mourn. Not because life is so hard for them, but because they have godly sorrow towards their sin. This mourning produces repentance leading to salvation without regret. Blessed are the meek, not because they are weak, but because they have supreme self-control, control, empowered by the Spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Not because they lack physical food, but because they are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. They recognize righteousness is found in God and not in themselves. Blessed are the merciful, not because they are pushovers, but because they have experienced mercy and continue to experience it. Blessed are the pure in heart, not because they're innately better than anyone else, but because they have been transformed by salvation and God's holiness extends to them. Blessed are the peacemakers, not because they avoid confrontation at all costs, but because they call others to embrace the gospel of holiness. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, not because they are seeking persecution, but because they are seeking righteousness. And blessed are those who reviled on his account, not because it is so beneficial, 
to have strained relationships with the world is because their focus is on their eternal relationship with Christ. Are we finding our sense of happiness, fortune, and peace outside of Christ? At the end of the day, when you evaluate yourself, what do you value? What is important to you? What is in your heart? A self-righteous person does not need Sorry, a self-righteous person does not see need for a savior or for change. Someone who does not recognize the great mercy bestowed upon them will not have an eye toward mercy for other people. And if your sin does not cause you to mourn, then you don't need to you don't see a need to stop sinning. If being persecuted or reviled on his account causes you to abandon your relationship with him, your eye is not on eternity, but only on today. To you, what the world thinks is more important than what he thinks. The fact that there are few who find God, God's way, implies that it must be sought diligently. No one's ever stumbled into the kingdom or wandered through the narrow gate by accident. Luke 12, 23, 24 says, when someone asked Jesus, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? He replied, strive to enter the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. The parable of the man who sells all to buy the field with a treasure in it. He isn't just seeking salvation. He's seeking relationship, ongoing intimacy with God. We were made for this purpose, to know him intimately. The kingdom... It's for those who come to the king in poverty of spirit, mourning over their sin and hungering and thirsting for his righteousness to replace their own. It is for those who want the kingdom at any cost, who will sell all that they have to buy that great treasure. It is not for those who want a cheap and easy way to assure heaven while continuing to live their own selfish and worldly lives on earth. Jesus only saves those for whom he becomes Lord. The world does not like Christians because Christians make absolute state statements like Jesus is not a way, he is the only way. But even within the group of those who claim Christ, I think there are some who would take exception to the statement that Jesus only saves those for whom he becomes Lord. Look at the rich young ruler. He found his happiness in his things. He wouldn't sacrifice it when called to give it up in order to follow Jesus, and so he doesn't. He keeps it, and he walks away sorrowful. One commentary that I was reading that was talking about this narrow gate said that it's so narrow, you can only get through it completely naked. You can't bring anything with you. You go through the narrow gate, you're leaving everything else behind. I did, a, I did a little bit of hiking on the Appalachian Trail in college, about 1,000 miles. And when I started, my pack weighed 55 pounds. When I finished, my pack weighed about 25 pounds. And when I go now, overnight, I keep my pack around 10 to 15 pounds. There is a direct correlation between how much weight you are carrying on a hike and how enjoyable that hike is. I guarantee it. It doesn't matter how scenic the surroundings are. If you are uncomfortable, you are not going to have a good time. Somehow, we have convinced ourselves that we can have it all. We can have the field with the treasure in it, but we don't have to sell everything to get it. We get to have salvation and remain our own master. That's what we want. The truth is, we can pay nothing for salvation. Yet coming to Jesus Christ costs everything that we have. Salvation is free. Following Jesus costs everything. And you know what? It's worth the cost. That's what Jesus is saying in his sermon. 
Everybody had an idea of what the kingdom of God would look like. Like the disciples, the many Jewish sects were thinking of a kingdom that existed like all the other kingdoms. It was based on earth, was filled with peace and prosperity, had prestige. But then what? What comes after the battles are won, and the storehouses are full, and the parades are over? When Christ made it known that the kingdom he was talking about was a spiritual one, without all the traditional perks that can only last in this lifetime, followers started to leave. I love when he asks his disciples if they want to leave also. Because Peter's response is what I want my heart's cry to be. Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe you are the Holy One of God. Is that what my children pick up from me? That nothing else, no one else is worth my life and devotion? That he's worth following despite what that might mean for how the world views me or what that might mean to my bank account? When our Wednesday night men's study group was looking at Psalm 73 a few weeks ago, I thought it was interesting that the writer, Asaph, looked at how his perspective affected the next generation after seemingly bemoaning how much success the wicked enjoyed and how he had kept his heart clean and yet was stricken by nothing but hardship. He says this, If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. If he had gone down that road, he would have betrayed the next generation, meaning that if he claimed to love and follow God but was jealous of the godless, then the message he was sending to those that came behind was that it wasn't worth it. But that's not the message that he lands on. After going into the sanctuary of the Lord, Asaph determines the end of the proud and the wicked is not worth it. Their ultimate fall and destruction is what awaits, not eternal glory. It says, For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You shall put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge. Is that the truth that we cling to? Is that the message we are sending to our children, biological or otherwise? The two groups represented in our verse today are both under the assumption that their way provides entrance to God's kingdom. The many on the broad path, however, will include pagans, nominal Christians, atheists, religionists, theists, humanists, Jews, Gentiles, every person from whatever age, background, persuasion, and circumstance who has not come to the saving obedience to Jesus Christ. The book of Matthew goes on to warn of false teachers within the church. And again, they're teaching a means other, other than through salvation and transformation in Christ to enter the kingdom. So many are the deceptions that may keep a person on the broad path. Hard is the way on the narrow. The struggle is real, and it is daily. And unless there is earnestness, the path can't be found. And this is the big challenge that I got from this passage. I don't want to be somebody that knows the truth, but does not embrace it, doesn't cling to it. I don't want to profess Jesus as Lord of my life, and yet, continue to do the easy things and fit my theology around what it is that I truly want, which is for me to be in control. The challenge for us is this. How do I struggle on this narrow path when it is so hard, when I feel like I want to want it, but I don't really want it? When I know Christ is the most important but I cannot seem to make myself act as if he means anything to me. 
Brad Sturm highlighted the following passage for me in Mark 9. You guys probably recall the story. A man brings his son, possessed by an evil spirit, to be healed by Jesus. And the disciples have tried to cast it out, and they have failed. And the boy is brought to Jesus, and he convulses on the ground. But before laying hands on him, Jesus turns to the father of the boy who is begging Jesus to help, if he can. And he says to the man, if you can. All things are possible for one who believes. And the father cries out, and I love this. He says, I believe. Help my unbelief. It's not a question of if Jesus can solve the problem. It's a question of whether or not the father of the boy believes. And the father knows he's missing something. On one hand, he has brought his son to Jesus to be healed. But on the other hand, Jesus is saying to him, something's lacking. And he begs Jesus to help his unbelief. And so Jesus does. He rebukes the spirit. The spirit departs. The boy is still. Jesus pulls him up, returns him to his father. But before Jesus pulls him up, he's laying there on the ground. And Mark says, everybody assumes he's dead. And in that moment, before the boy was lifted up, what was the boy's father thinking? If the boy never gets up, is Jesus still the man's hope? If he loses what's precious to him, but gains Jesus, is that enough? I believe Jesus can heal what I treasure, but do I believe that Jesus can be what I treasure? We don't know what the father thought in that moment, but we know that he believed and yet still had unbelief. And he begged Jesus to help him with that. When's the last time you have sincerely and consistently begged God to help your unbelief? To give you the faith that you lack and the love for him that you desire but don't always feel. If I were to send you off with two thoughts, they would be the, they would be these things. Are you really on the narrow path? And what is it worth for you to either stay on it or get on it? Because Jesus does not hold back throughout his ministry when he talks about following him. He doesn't hold back when he talks about pursuing the kingdom of God. He always says it's hard. It involves sacrifice. People will hate us. We will have crosses to bear. In Mark 10, 29, 30, Jesus says, There is none who has left house or brother or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and into age to come eternal life. The path is narrow and steep and hard. We enter alone, but we don't walk alone. And Jesus reminds, we may lose everything, but he also gives us everything. Some of those blessings we see in this life having spiritual siblings and parents who mean so much to us is one of those incredible things we don't ever expect outside of Christ. It's not on, it's not on anybody's radar until they experience it. But even this we experience amidst trials and persecution. I want to end by looking ahead. That last verse says, and in the age to come, eternal life. And he doesn't just mean life that extends into eternity. He means true life, as John describes in the end of his gospel, life in his name, life in Christ, that intimacy with the Father, Son, and Spirit in a place without distraction and sin, we can't even imagine, but we can try. 
a few weeks ago in Breaking of Bread. We read a verse in Isaiah 35 when Tom was sharing. And it speaks of Israel and the Messianic age, but the imagery is so beautiful. In Isaiah 35, 8, it says, And a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. Christ himself will be the leader on that way, taking the redeemed back to Jerusalem, literally and spiritually. And I imagine that is what heaven is like. In the presence of Christ and walking on a wide way of holiness, no longer hard, no longer a struggle, easy, natural. Even those of us who are less bright than the others can't get lost. And then, like now, Christ will be enough. But then, unlike now, we won't have any other thought than to be intimately known by him and to know him back. Let's close in prayer. Dad, we could be pretty messed up. Completely messed up. We are overwhelmed by your goodness and your grace. Give us the mind and the strength to live like it. Cause our hearts to follow long and hard after you. Establish our identities in you. Help our lack of faith. I believe. Help my unbelief. Give us eyes towards eternity. We have a narrow path to walk now. Allow our minds to turn towards your word, which is a light to us on this journey. Thank you for making us, loving us, and seeking us. We love you back. Help us love you more. Amen. You are dismissed.